and I'm going to go ahead and introduce Talia and myself. So I am uh, Catherine de Cristofaro. I'm a librarian with the St. Mary's County Library. And I am so excited to introduce our speaker for today, US Today and Wall Street Journal bestselling author Talia Hibbert. Talia is the author of such books as Get a Life, Chloe Brown, which is the first in the Brown Sisters trilogy. The third will be out in March. That's, is that correct, Talia? Yeah, well, and that March 9th. March 9th, and I can't wait to read it. That one is Act Your Age, Eve Brown, and oh, I, everybody needs to go put all of her books on hold for the library because they're the best, or buy them. Do both, really, just do both. Um, so she writes steamy, diverse romance because she believes that people of marginalized identities need honest and positive representation, and today we get to ask her about them. So the first part is I'm gonna be asking Talia some questions, and then we should have some time at the end um, as long as we don't run too long and I will cut myself off or Jill or Emma can also cut me off to do that. And I am going to turn the chat on so people, um, uh, if they want to put some comments in, they can. And we will use the Q&A function at the end if we have time. And Jill just put into the chat, you can turn off the captions if you'd like and how to do that. And all right, so Talia, if you are okay, I'm going to uh, get started. Sounds good. All right. So how did you start writing and in particular writing romance? Um, I have always been a really big reader and I feel like because I loved reading so much, becoming a writer was kind of like my childhood dream because writers are so cool. Um, and I started reading romance when I was 12. And from that moment, romance became like my number one genre forevermore. So when I did decide that it was time to take the plunge and try to be a writer, it just seemed so obvious that it should be romance because that was what I was reading the most and that's what I loved the most. So you said you read your first romance at 12. Can I ask what it was and if you would still recommend it today or is it one of those where you're like, oh, I, maybe not in today's. <laughs> no, I was lucky. My first romance was Splendid by Julia Quinn, which I'm <sighs> confident still recommending. Like I read it so long ago that I actually don't remember a huge number of details now, but I do remember like that the whole reading experience made me feel so happy and her books are so funny and so fun. So yeah, that was a great one. I remember there was a picnic and it was a very exciting picnic. <laughs> That's the perfect, that's the perfect, I feel like, definition of romance books. Like, it made me feel happy and fun. Like, that's, that's why we read romance. <laughs> um, so as far as your writing, uh, I mean, they always talk about tropes in romance and how there's the enemies to lovers or forced proximity. Are there any that you just love reading and writing about and or any that you're like, it is just not for me? <laughs> um, I love tropes, like in general, love them, love to read them, love to write them. I'd say my absolute favorite to read is one that I find kind of tricky to get a hold of, which is um, like a marriage of convenience or an arranged marriage, especially if it's outside of historical romance, because I think it's quite common in historical, but in say contemporary romance, it's a bit trickier. Um, so I really love to read that. I haven't managed to write it yet, but I want to. <laughs> um, and I really love writing things like friends to lovers or even enemies to lovers, as long as it's something where they've had a relationship before their romantic relationship. So there's like a familiarity that changes somehow. Um, and I honestly, the only trope I think I dislike is probably the secret baby trope. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> but at the same time, I, I read it in um, Fumbled by Alexa Martin and I really liked that book, but that might just be because I like Alexa Martin. So who knows? <laughs> I mean, sometimes if you have an author who can do a trope that and can do it well, it's like, all right, I'll you can do this. this. Yeah. Like, right. <laughs> I, well, you. I, I mean, I would say, wouldn't the the princess trap kind of be a a marriage of or at least an engagement of convenience? I mean, I would love that interpretation of it. Yes. I, okay, so I say you've already written one and a very good one at yeah. that. So I think. I think Thank you're good. You. <laughs> um, here, I'm putting the links to the different books you recommended. So if I pause, uh, forgive me. Uh, okay, so oh, we already talked about the Brown Sisters. So the three books in the series are Get a Life, Chloe Brown is number one, Take a Hint, Danny Brown, and then coming out will be Act Your Age, Eve Brown. All three sisters are so wonderful. They're so different. 
who, which one came to you first? Like, or did they all kind of grow up together? Chloe definitely came first. And then as I was thinking about the kind of character she was in my head, I was like, okay, how did she become this person? And it seemed obvious to me that she would be an oldest sister. So then I started to think, well, who are her younger sisters? And that's when I started to work on Danny and Eve. And that's probably why they're both kind of chaotic because Chloe needs a reason to be so tired and cynical all the time. <laughs> the best way, like she's the best <laughs> type of cynic. I love her. <laughs> um, so my, at least so far in the, not having read the third one yet, the Gigi is definitely my favorite secondary character. <laughs> is Gigi a real person? Like, do you have a Gigi in your life? And if you do, can you tell us all about her? Cause she's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so Gigi is kind of like an amalgamation of all three of my grandmas. I had three grandmas growing up and I called them all grandma and they were all friends. And it was very confusing <gasps> because they'd often all be in the house at the same time. And I'd be like, grandma? And they'd be like, yeah. Um, so I guess it makes sense to kind of meld them together. Um, and honestly, they were all kind of integral to my life growing up. And I suppose to the person I've become and I found them all really inspiring and supportive and lovely. So when I was writing a grandmother, I was like, this is what I want her to be. Oh, I love that so much. Like that just, that, that's just so lovely. Oh, somebody asked in the chat if there's any chance you would write Gigi her own book. Yeah, she deserves one. She does, but I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think that when you read Actor Age Eve Brown, you'll be happy with Gigi's story in that book. I That's hope. great. Oh, oh, I cannot <laughs> wait. Could it be March now? Um, okay. Oh, so um, Danny in her book, her research is so important to her. Her work is, is such a big part of her life. Um, and is that something that you, have you done research on feminism that she's studying? Yeah, not to the level she's at because sure. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not that smart. I'm not no, you're not academic. a doctoral student. You have a you have a giant career as a romance author. No, no, no. You don't get to say you're not smart. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not academic, but um, I did go to university and I studied English. And the the modules that I loved the most were kind of contextualizing, you know, the things we read in society. So. Through that, I read some feminist texts that really interested me. I mean, I feel like I was already interested in feminism because of my family being very aggressive feminists, but that's kind of when I got into the texts and that definitely influenced how I write Danny, mainly because I didn't know any other academic topic. So I was like, okay, she's got to be interested in this. <laughs> oh, but it fits her so well. I mean, she's, she's amazing. I... <laughs> I want to be Danny. I will never be as cool as Danny, but I want to be as cool as Danny. I don't think anyone will be as cool as Danny. So <laughs> <that's> okay. <laughs> okay, that makes me feel better. <laughs> so actually kind of on that, the vein of feminism and romance, um, in the past, romance books and authors have not gotten the same uh, respect from critics sometimes and readers who do not read romance. I think that's changing a little bit. Um, I mean, do you see that change? Uh, why do you think you see it if you do? Or do you think we still have a lot of work to do when it comes to that? I'm kind of at the point, and I say at the point, I feel like I've been like this for years, where uh, if you, if someone has a thing against romance or someone wants to look down on romance purely because it's romance, I'm like, okay, your opinion is dirt because <laughs> clearly you're a misogynist plus some other things most likely. So I honestly don't care. You know, when it's really annoying to me when especially men are like, oh, I used to think this about romance, but now I think this. And it's like, okay, well, we all know why you thought that thing in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna be like, yay, but good for you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> so, I feel like I'm just really disconnected from opinions from all people, you know, negative Great. things about romance. Cause it's like, I no longer care what you think, <laughs> but you know at the that same has... time. Oh, that has to be the healthiest way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> just for my blood pressure. <laughs> but I do think, I do think you're right and that it is changing, but I'm also like, 
good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they don't deserve pats on the head. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Um, so let's see. If you could pick any author, living or dead, as a mentor or a writing partner, who would you who would you say, like, let's go to the coffee shop and write together? Well, I actually feel really lucky because, you know, writing in romance, everyone is so nice. And I've ended up, like, having the opportunity to talk to authors that I idolize. And so I feel like... I've already kind of had that experience. I wouldn't say anyone has like mentored me, but people have been so kind and always given me tips and support. And then sometimes it's people who I've been reading since I was literally like 13 and I'm like, what is happening? So <laughs> That's amazing. Everyone's Are there so any nice. that you could, you could say like, we should all go and read their back catalogs now? Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So this is the part where my mind goes blank. But it's yes. okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> like, Nalini Singh, <gasps> Beverly Jenkins, like there's so many authors, but these are the people who have like these huge, masterful back catalogs and have made such an impact on the genre, I think, and like on my reading mind, definitely. And then sometimes I get to like speak to them a bit and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> um, so uh, side note, and this will be posted, it'll be up on our website soon. Nalini Singh is actually going to do uh, something like this with us in June. Um, so Tally, if you want to come, I will send Let you the link. Let me just write this <laughs> down. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, I'll send it to you. <laughs> and um, Beverly Jenkins, I have not gotten up the courage to email her yet. Um, but I'll be like, well, Talia did it. And she said <laughs> she's, that you're her favorite. So and She'll be like, who? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, oh, side question. Somebody in the chat wanted to know, so Chloe and Danny, why is Eve Eve and not Evie? Did she just not want to be like her big sisters? Sometimes she is called Evie, <gasps> but this whole book is about her trying to be like mature. So I feel like uh, she wouldn't want, she wouldn't want the title to be Evie. She's like, my name's I, Eve. <laughs> I like it. I like how she's told you this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what was the last romance that you read that you just want everyone else to read to? This morning I finished, I mean, I only started it last night and I read a few pages and I woke up and I was like, I must get back to this book. Um, I finished an advanced copy of For the Love of April French by Penny Ames and it was amazing. It doesn't come out for a while, so I feel bad recommending it, but That's I think okay. you can pre-order it now. And Which there's I a link recommend. on, yeah, and I'm going to put the, Goodreads has a link for it, so I'm going to put it there, and it has a place where you can pre-order, um, so awesome. What did you, uh, was there anything in particular that just made you so excited about it? So many things. One aspect that really stood out to me was the structure of it, which I haven't actually come across before, so there weren't technically chapters, but it was split into four parts, I think, and part one was alternating point of view characters between the hero and the heroine and then part two was purely the heroine's point of view and then part three was the hero's point of view on everything that just happened in part two <gasps> and then part four was both of them again and I found that like it was amazing for the story but also just really interesting from like a nerd perspective it was cool oh yeah oh that's really fascinating so then okay so the second part is you got to go back and see everything that happened, but the way he was viewing it, yeah. basically. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, yeah, I'll have to put that. I, <laughs> I love books that, that take the genre and then just, like, twist it with the format. It's always so interesting if it's done well. Yeah, definitely. Oh, cool. Um, so who is your, of all the books you've written, who is your, your heroine or hero that you just love? Like, who is your favorite? <laughs> This is a super hard question. You can have more than, you don't have to have one favorite. You can have like 12 favorites. That's like a rule, right? Okay, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> um, maybe, I would say my first favorite is Chastity from Mating the Huntress <gasps> because <Sorry>. she, <laughs> she is from a family of werewolf huntresses and <laughs> a werewolf falls in love with her they're like fated mates and she's like I should kill him like he's a werewolf I'm gonna kill him and she's so she spends half of the book just trying to kill him and he's like babe stop you're in love <laughs> this is gonna happen she's like stab and it's great 
I mean, he, even after he make he brings her delicious cupcakes and he still she still tries to stop him. I'm like, I do not understand you, Chastity. You a are a mess. Iron. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I've got my pine and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so um before we started, uh, I had asked uh, Talia a question about one of her other books as far as series go. And so it kind of relates to that. This one says Monsters and Mates book one. Are we gonna get more more books in this? Yes. Maybe? <gasps> really? Yay! Because she has like a thousand siblings, so she I was like, dies. everybody gets a book. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, yeah, everybody, uh, go read Mating the Huntress. Uh, it is a great Halloween book, but I read it in December. It was great. Read it whenever <laughs> you want. Um, so, is there a hero in another book you've read, or same kind of idea? Like, you want to go get coffee with this heroine or hero that you read from another book? So many. I feel like. It depends because there are some books where you love the character. For example, um, Heart of Obsidian by Nalini Singh. I love Caleb, but I would prefer to never meet him because he is terrifying. <laughs> so yeah. I love him from a distance. <laughs> but then there's some characters, especially characters who are like recurring characters and mysteries and things like that. We really fall in love with them that start to feel like best friends. I would say the book that I read recently where I found myself like really falling in love with the characters was The Gentle Art of Fortune Hunting by KJ Charles. And I love both of the heroes, but one of them is a fortune hunter and a con man. And he was great. <laughs> I was like, be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, KJ Charles writes amazing amazing books um she does yeah romance and mystery kind of combined that yeah so would you is mystery would that be kind of like your next genre that you love or there are besides romance is there another one that you just you also veer towards no I only like <laughs> I only like romance that's also something else you know romance Fair. that's mystery or romance that's sci-fi but when I try and read things that have no romance I'm like but it's horrible can't do it. Um, oh, somebody in the chat asked if you would ever consider writing a queer romance. Oh, yeah, I already have. Um, oh, there you go. It's <laughs> Work For It. And it's about, it's about a man who gets very sad. So he goes to a fruit farm because <laughs> that's what you do when you get sad, apparently. Yeah. Um, and he meets the manager of the fruit farm and then they make out in the forest a lot. And I really <laughs> like it. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's what everyone should do if you're having a bad day. Go to a good farm. Go make out with the manager. Um, so I guess, would you consider writing outside of romance? Or again, would it be more of a, maybe a sci-fi romance, but not a... Yeah, I, I would love to write more kind of subgenres of romance, but I feel like anything I write you know, I have, when I was younger, attempted to write things that weren't romance and it never worked because I was always like, and then they went off to kiss and the plot falls <laughs> to the wayside. <laughs> so it would always be something romance adjacent. I think, I, I mean, if anything, that just shows that you knew what you needed to do, even from a young age. You're like, no, there has to be kissing. Um, so are there any secondary characters, either in your books or books you've read, where you're like, this character just needs their, to have their own book? I most often get that feeling when I read Rebecca Weatherspoon. And the great thing about that is she always writes the book for the character. Oh, <laughs> like, without fail. So that's great for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, her... Um, her cowboy series with the fairy tale retellings, how all of the brothers are getting a story. It's like, yes, just keep feeding me all of those books. Just keep it coming. And I love fairy tale retellings. So amazing. Oh. And who knew you could do fairy tale retellings of cowboys in California? I know, right? What a combo. Yeah. <laughs> way smarter than I'll ever be. It's great. <laughs> um, let's see. So I, uh, You've been, you put on your Instagram a little while ago that your one of your books, The Princess Trap, has a new cover. It went from being, um, I think the old one was a guy who was shirtless wearing a crown. Yeah. And then <laughs> this new one is amazing. It's this, um, let me see if I can put it into the chat because it's just so pretty. Do you get a say 
on your cover art at all? Is that something you get to work with? It depends. So some of my books are self-published. The Princess Trap is. So I basically worked with the cover designer, um, Erin O'Neill Jones, who is amazing, um, to figure out what we wanted the cover to look like because I, I'm actually really bad at art and stuff and I'm bad at visualizing. So I was like, I want this feeling. I want this vibe. And she was like, okay. And I like, made some stuff and I was like, perfect. Um, but then when it's with my publisher, it's not really the same because marketing professionals have to make the decisions, but they do give me like a really huge amount of input, which I really appreciate. Awesome. Even though I should not be trusted because I'm not an expert. <laughs> Did you get to do work with the covers for the Brown Sisters? Yes. Um, it was kind of like before the cover style was decided, I was told that it was going to be illustrated. And my editor said that I could collect examples of like how I wanted the characters to look, um, book covers that I liked and maybe art styles that I didn't like so much. So I put together this like over the top report and sent it to her. Amazing. <laughs> she was probably like, oh my God, but <laughs> they, I feel like they took it very seriously. Um, yeah. And they gave me some options and I loved all of them. And then it was just like choosing. Um, and there was this one time when there were four different color options for the book and I liked one option, but I wasn't allowed that option because it looks too young for the book. And I was very upset and flounced around the house for an hour. But then I was like, actually, this other option is just as good. So glad I got over that. <laughs> That's good. But also good for feeling your feelings. Like you, know, you needed to <laughs> embrace those feelings so you can move forward. I think that's great. Uh, so kind of related to that, for audiobooks, do you get to have any say in who the readers are? Yes. I mean, it depends on who's doing the audiobook, you know, publisher-wise. But generally, they give me a list of people to choose from. Or they say, like, do you have any suggestions or requests? And I can suggest things if I want to. Um, but actually... I'm not like a huge audiobook listener because my attention span is very bad. So I usually feel like I'm not best placed to choose, <laughs> but I can choose a bit if I want to, which is nice. It is nice. Uh, fun fact for everyone, the audiobook reader for uh, Chloe Brown is also the actress who plays Lady Danbury in Bridgerton, Ajoa uh, uh, Endo, I believe is how you say her name. Um, and she's, she's amazing. Cool. Yeah, so if you want to hear Lady Danbury read an audiobook, uh, it's great. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so in your, in the text about you on your website, and that I, I completely stole for your introduction, <laughs> um, it talks about how you write about marginalized characters. And some of the characters in your books are dealing with, um, with, mental illness and and going to therapy and getting treatment and some are dealing with physical ailments and taking care of themselves how do you write about this the representation is so good it's some of the best i've seen in romance how do you do this so well thank you it's very important to me because a lot of it is kind of affected by my life experiences either from my own issues with mental health or from family members or even friends. I feel like it's had a big impact in my life and it's something I've always had to be aware of and something that I've kind of had to learn how to manage or how to help support other people with. So when I'm writing, I do very much take from life as I see it and want to kind of represent the aspects of life that I feel are sometimes missed out on the page when I'm reading especially when I was younger, I felt that way. Now I don't really feel like that because there's a lot going on. But growing up, it was always like, well, why isn't this there? Or I'd read like a hero behaving in a certain way. And I'd be like, obviously he's having intrusive thoughts right now, but it wouldn't be in the book. So it was just something that I wanted to explicitly put in my books. And I think because I have either sympathy or empathy I hope that that makes it more realistic and okay for people to read. Yeah um, as somebody put in the comments uh, kind of related to that that your research or inspiration did you utilize for the chronic pain that Chloe deals with that it was just such a um, it said that it really helped her understand her roommate better with her struggles and that thank you for that too. 
Oh, well, that's really great. Um, I actually have chronic pain myself, and that's why I wanted to write a rom-com with a heroine who had chronic pain, because obviously it sucks, but then a lot of the time you're like, this is objectively hilarious that I'm like bum shuffling down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> this could be funny. So <laughs> that's where Chloe came from. Uh, so this is a, a, a behind the scenes, this is a question specific for Chloe dealing with her chronic pain. In the book, Red gives her a container that holds her hairbands and it has like a top that is easy for her to get into. A, I want this and B, I cannot figure out, like, did you make this up? Is this a real thing? Can I order it on Amazon? My sister made it up. <gasps> she invents things. <laughs> she's very good, very cool. Um, she's nine, but bright future. Okay, so not on Amazon yet. What it is, yeah. you have to let us all know so we can buy this hairband holder. Okay. I will. <laughs> um, are there any, like, when you're, are there any sort of in, behind the scenes inspirations of your characters that we might find funny or interesting to know that somehow made it into your books? Um, in Act Your Age, Eve Brown, the hero, Jacob, was created because I already knew that Eve was like a very chaotic character. And when I was thinking, okay, who is her perfect match? I was like, it should be someone who finds her like really annoying. Everyone loves her. <laughs> she needs to meet someone who's like, oh my God, what, what are you doing? <laughs> so I kind of created Jacob as someone who like, obviously he doesn't really find her annoying, but the way that he chooses to present himself to the world is so opposite of the way she chooses to do it that he's like appalled on principle that she's doing this. Like why? He doesn't understand. He can't wrap his head around it. And um, this book is set in the Lake District and I went on a trip to the Lake District for research because I'm amazing um, <laughs> with my boyfriend. And I found the ducks really intimidating. So I was like, obviously he hates ducks. I'm going to put that in the book because they're scary. Fair. <laughs> They are. <laughs> uh, well, that's amazing. Uh, so basically, uh, actor age Eve Brown is going to be a grumpy one, loves the chaotic sunshine one, which yes. I mean, what, like, uh, again, if you have not read that particular trope, everyone go, go read this book. <laughs> It'll, I'm, it's going to be amazing. Um, so if you could call up Netflix today and be like, hey, you're going to make one of my books into a movie or show, which, which ones would, would it be? I think the Brown Sisters series, I think, would like make the best in terms of being like <laughs> hooky and watchable, make the best show. Um, I would really like to see something very weird that I've written as a TV show, like Sweet on the Greek, which is a pro footballer falls in love at first sight with like a super grumpy goth and he pretends that he needs her to be his fake girlfriend, hoping that being his fake girlfriend will make her want to be his real girlfriend. <sighs> and then they like go on holiday to Spain. And I'm like, that would be an amazing film. Probably no one else thinks so, but I think so. <laughs> um, I think only crazy people wouldn't think so. Who doesn't want to watch, watch that? Somebody in the chat just said that they love that book. And they, so yeah, yeah. you have two people already who said. Um, so which of your characters was the hardest to write? Were there any that just wouldn't uh, do what you wanted on the page? Um, Danny was really hard to write from Take a Hint, Danny Brown, because I'm like fundamentally her opposite, I think. So I was like, what would she do in this situation? I have no idea. Um, and I had to write everything like a thousand times to get to something that I felt was in character. Cause I was like, I just don't understand you. Why are you doing this? But she had to do it. So kind of off of that, what is your process? Like, how do you start from, I have this idea for this character story to here editor, I am ready for it to be published. What is your process? I'm asking myself that same question. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that I tend to start with one character who captures me for whatever reason. And then I think, who would be their perfect match? And then I think, what would be the perfect situation to like force them together and make everything terrible and great at the same time? Um, so then I kind of, I plan out one character's personal journey, I plan out the other character's personal journey, I plan out 
like the timings of the story based on the key tropes that I want to use. I like building stories around tropes and then I just kind of slam it together. Amazing. That's great. Um, let's see. If you could uh, write, so I know you said earlier that you've been able to sort of ask questions from other authors, but are there any authors that you would love to like write a book with? I feel like I'd be terrible at like co-writing a book. It sounds really hard. <laughs> I don't know how people do it. So many people do it. And I'm like, how are you doing this? But if I had to, I feel like I would do the best possible version of that book if I co-wrote it with Charlotte Stein, because first of all, because I really like her, so <laughs> that helps. But second, because like when I read her books, I feel like, oh, this is how I want my book to be. And I feel like we have the same writing vibe. So I think she'd be my best bet. Is she, so looking on Goodreads, did she write Deeper Than Desire series? Is that her? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I follow her on, I follow her on Twitter, but I didn't She's great. realize that. <laughs> Feels silly now. Um, She's amazing. Uh, do you have any uh, comfort reads that you return to over and over again? Well, funnily enough, Never Sweeter by Charlotte Stein oh. is probably like <laughs> one of my most reread books. Um, I also really love, um, and now I've completely forgotten the name of one of my favorite books, but it's over here so I can check. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri, which is a fantasy romance, which is like one of my favorite subgenres of romance ever. And it's amazing and it has a arranged marriage trope, which I love. So um, what else do I reread? Oh, I like to reread um, Any Old Diamonds by KJ Charles and Hookshot by Kennedy Ryan. I think those are the ones that I kind of rotate around again and again. I think I got them with the Hookshot. Uh, okay, okay. Sorry for your patience as I like jump oh, back no. and forth between. So I was like, well, I'm going to need all of these. So I'm assuming everyone <laughs> else will too. Um, so has, do you think the pandemic has changed how you've been writing at all? Like your process or how your books will be? Do you think that'll affect like the characters at all in your books? It's definitely changed how I write. It's made me write way slower. Um, First of all, because everything is just so dismal that I used to be filled with energy and sit down to write like, yeah, we're gonna write. And now everything I do, I'm like, oh, this again. So <laughs> my writing is just a lot more labored. Um, but I'm hoping that it's not gonna affect my characters because in my books, the pandemic is not happening. So it. hopefully they're just <laughs> living their best lives. That's what I'm hoping. So I want for them. <laughs> so what is the role or work of Italia Hibbert Hero to dismantle the patriarchy? Well, first of all, I like to write heroes who subvert patriarchal tropes. Um, so that's one element, you know, in terms of who they are and what they care about and how they express themselves. I like to write heroes who are aware of their power or their privilege over whoever they're around and who maybe think of ways to counteract that or at the very least acknowledge it. Um, but then in addition to that, I like when I write MF relationships, I like to make the heroes do most of the emotional labor because I know that the general expectation is that it's going to be the opposite and I don't think it should be and I don't think it always is so I want to show you know the other side and kind of amplify that with my books. Love it and it's true anybody who has somehow not read one of her books yet yes this is so true and everyone should go fix that problem right now. Uh, <laughs> so what what is the last book that made you join the Bad Decision Book Club? And for those of you who do not know that, that's when you stay up all night long reading a book and go, it was worth it, but oh my God, I'm so tired. <laughs> I kind of do it the opposite way because I can't stay up late. Like I 
my ability to sleep is ridiculous. So what I do instead is I wake up and I'm like, oh, just read really quickly to start the day. And then I stay in bed <laughs> and it's terrible. <laughs> No, no, you, um, you've joined the Good Decision Book Club. Like, this is how we should all be doing it. I actually literally did that today with, I think I mentioned it earlier, for the Love yeah. of April French, yeah? I, I started reading it last night, but it was a few pages, and then I fell asleep, and I woke up, and I was like, I need to read it, and I stayed in bed until, like, three o'clock in the afternoon finishing this book, because <laughs> it was so good. And it was, like, so soft and like I just love books where the characters are just really really kind to each other and also it was very like it's like a BDSM romance which I haven't read a ton of so I was like oh this is very exciting um so it was a great combination of feelings <laughs> wonderful so if somebody came up to you and you're like hey I've heard of this whole romance genre I want to read a book what would you be like okay this is where you start oh my god, what a mighty burden. I'd give them like <laughs> at least 10 books, all of That's which are the start of a series. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like like capturing, it's difficult because there's so many different subgenres and everything, but like capturing, say, contemporary romance the way it is at the minute, I would probably give them The Worst Best Man by Mia Sosa, which is such a fun, tropey story and it feels so like, modern but still like that's romance yes sir <laughs> um and then for historical romance i would probably give them this is hard but i would probably give them captured by beverly jenkins is that what it's called the pirate one i've also got this oh, on yes. myself let me look <laughs> yes the pirate one because it's like classic romance excellence but Beverly Jenkins. Do, 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 do. Amazing. And She's magical. It has the best cover of all time. The best cover of all time. And then also, well, the, you know, I'm going to stop there. This is going on. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> well, I might also give them something by Gail Carriger because, yeah, Soulless. Oh, um, yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, it's an amazing combo of like multiple things that romance can be and also because it's hilarious and everyone should read it. Um, I would give them, oh, I'd give them a side changeling book um, because it's another one of those like romance staple series that you have to read. Um, wow, this is, yeah, I think they'd have enough to read from that point. That's good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be coming back to you and be like, Okay, you know your romance stuff. Sounds good. <laughs> um, Side Changeling is Nalini Singh's books. Uh, so uh, we are, I have a Nalini link in there. So I, I think we're okay there. Um, okay. So you mentioned earlier that you have done self-publishing and then with the Brown Sisters, that was your first series that was published by a larger house. Um, yeah. What was the process? Uh, how was it different? Do you prefer one to the other? Are there good things about both? There's definitely good things about both. And I feel like different books suit different methods. Um, like I have some books that I self-published that I loved so much, but I really don't think a publisher would have published them because they were just very weird. <laughs> um, and then like the Brown Sisters books, I feel like they would have done well if I self-published them, but they were really like positioned well to be like published by Avon. So I'm, I'm going to continue doing both because I feel like they both have their place for me um, it was definitely a change of pace because when you're self-publishing something there's obviously a lot of control but also a lot of responsibility and maybe pressure and I really enjoy like sorting out marketing and making decisions because it's just something a bit different from writing that is one of my additional interests but then at the same time it is always nice to have other people to do stuff for you and you just write the book so <laughs> Um, so I'm going to ask this in the most librarian way possible. Uh, <laughs> how do you go about writing such lovely, romantic, and intimate scenes? Those, those, those parts of your books are really well done. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like it's largely because I've been reading romance so long 
Yeah. And I've read so many different romance novels and I do read, read closed door romance, but the vast majority of what I read does have intimate scenes. <laughs> you so... can, you can, <laughs> you're not a librarian, you're fine. You can say however you want. <laughs> so, you know, when you have all these different examples of like the way that sex scenes can do different things and then you just have to decide what you want yours to do and try and hit that note. Um, and I guess, yeah, that's what I try and do. I try and make sure that everything the characters do in one of those scenes kind of tracks with the way they are outside of them. Even if they do behave differently, there has to be a reason for that that's like embedded in their personality. Um, and I also try to make sure there's lots of talking, mostly because I'm not good at just like writing movements because I don't know my left and right and it all gets very complicated. <laughs> um. But moving away from romance for just a second, what is your favorite tea? I feel like if I'm talking to a British author, I have to ask you, how do you drink your tea? Or do you drink tea? Because I feel like maybe it's a stereotype that I put on you now. I don't think it's a stereotype because literally everyone I know is constantly drinking tea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I was a disgrace for many years because oh, I did no. not drink tea. And it was a big source of discord in my family. Um, <laughs> I had one particular uncle who like every time he drank tea like six times a day and every time he'd be like, do you want a cuppa? And I'd be like, I don't like tea. And he'd be like, I just keep hoping that you'd change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> so now I drink tea. It's just the bullying, really. I still don't like it that much. Um, I prefer fruit tea, especially lemon. It's <laughs> lovely. I don't know if you can get tea. I don't American tea versus British tea, but the Tezo lemon loaf, highly recommend if that is available for you. I'll keep an eye out. It's quite good. <laughs> um, so uh, do you see your, what do you do when you hit writer's block? Because that has to happen, right? Even for, for professional writers, I imagine. Professional. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like most of the time when I can't write anymore, it's because something else is like wrong or bothering me. Um, especially it happens if I've been writing too much and now I'm just like writing words, but the inspiration or the energy is gone. And then I write myself into a terrible lifeless corner. And then I'm like, ah, I can't write anymore. I've failed. I don't know where to go from here. So usually when I'm struggling with writer's block, I take a break and I try to read something else and watch something else that I really enjoy or admire to kind of like refill the well and remember that creating stuff is like worthwhile because sometimes I forget. <laughs> that sounds incredibly healthy and we should probably all do that when we hit our, we can't do it anymore. <laughs> so everybody listen to Talia, this is great. Uh, have you noticed any differences between US and UK's romance novels or how US writers and UK uh, I'm sorry, UK and US readers respond to romance at all? Yeah, definitely. I feel like, first of all, you know, illustrated covers are big in the US right now, but over here, that's the only kind of romance cover you saw my entire life. Um, unless it was a Mills and Boone category romance, but they would be on a special shelf. And if you went near the shelf, everyone would look at you. So <laughs> I Is mostly read... I, I just remember they're called something different, aren't they? Are they like, is it like what, what I would think of as Harlequin? Like the, yes. the bodice? Okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we call them Mills and Boone. Okay. I don't know why the name is different. Um, but yeah, so those were the books that I always kind of looked at because I knew they were romance and I wanted to read them, but I couldn't read them because everyone was looking at me. So <laughs> instead, I would look for a cartoon cover that might be romance but also might be like chiclet about a woman whose dog died and you could never really tell from the cover or the blurb or anything <laughs> so I feel like a lot of that is because I don't think in the UK we're more prudish about sex I think people think that's the case but it's not but it I do think <laughs> I, I think, think we're definitely <laughs> But I think over here, it's just considered so embarrassing to talk about emotions. If you get an emotional book, everyone's like, ew, what are you doing? <laughs> so we don't really talk about it. And I, I do get tagged in like UK readers who are talking about my book 
but they describe it as like chiclet or women's fiction purely because I don't think genre romance is talked about as much over here to the point where they're not sure what to call it, if you see what I mean. That's like what they assume it is because that's the biggest category we have. Um, and I think that as a result, romance is much more mainstream in the US than it is over here. Like in the US, it's on the news, um, it's on morning television shows, it's in Oprah magazine. And over here, it has to be a very specific kind of, of romance to, to be looked at that way. Oh, okay. All right, I'm gonna ask you one more of my questions and then if it's if you don't mind, we'll do a couple of the Q and A's from the, from the audience. Okay, great. Um, so actually, I'm gonna ask you two quick ones. One's very serious though. Oh, no. um, th that one is, if you were a judge on the Great British Baking Show, uh, the Great British Bake Off, what bake would you demand that they make to perfection for you? Chocolate fudge cake. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I want that now. Or gingerbread. Or both. Now, would your gingerbread, would they need to make like a house or do you want like gingerbread you want to eat? I want like a gingerbread structure that's not a house. I want to see some originality. I want to see some height. Okay. I like it. I think you should talk to them about being a judge <laughs> so that you can go and eat your gingerbread. They would jump at the chance, I'm sure. I, I mean, they'd be a fool not to. <laughs> and then my last thought I'll ask you, and then I'll turn it over to our, our lovely audience. Um, your books are funny, like they're they're romantic, they're swoony, but they're also, I have startled my husband and child more than once snorting from your books. Um, how have you honed that comedic ability? Well, everyone who knows me thinks I'm not funny at all. <laughs> Every time I tell jokes, everyone's like, oh my God, can you stop? <laughs> so I have honed it through years of being ignored and having slippers thrown at me. Um, but also I think <laughs> through like reading and watching people who are really funny, like I love watching sitcoms and comedies and things like um, Chewing Gum and Fleabag. Um, and I feel like that's influenced me a lot. Oh, I know, I know Fleabag, but I did not know Chewing Gum. I'm gonna grab that while um, we're asking the questions in the comments. Okay, so somebody asked, do you know um, the demographics of your readers? I think Chloe Brown crossed into non-romance readers. Do you have any specific takeaway or messages you would want to convey through your books to those readers? I do think that they're right in saying that the Brown sisters kind of crossed over into non-romance readers because I get tagged in posts of people who are like, I haven't read romance in years or I've never read a romance and now I'm reading this. Um, and I feel like so many more people would enjoy romance if they let go of misconceptions that they had or let go of self-consciousness that they might feel. And I think that that's been proven by the reaction of those readers who aren't typically romance readers. So I guess my main, my main message that I'd like to pass on to anyone who reads my book is that it's okay to just enjoy yourself. It's okay to enjoy things. And you don't have to worry about what other people think or what you think you're supposed to think. You can just chill. And let's see, somebody asked, uh, do you think eBooks have changed the romance book market at all? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like because of eBooks, the big self-publishing boom in romance happened because, you know, if it weren't for ebooks, that really couldn't have happened. And I think that self-publishing completely changed the romance market because it took away gatekeeping and it allowed for so many more authors of diverse experiences to put out the stories that they'd been told no one was interested in and to prove that actually that wasn't the case. And that applies to kind of marginalized authors. And it also applies to all kinds of stories that maybe didn't fit the the mainstream safe businessy interpretations of what was a good story but actually it was something new and something different that maybe people had been waiting for so yeah i feel like ebooks completely changed the game um so somebody asked a little bit about your writing process like if somebody was going to start writing a book how would you tell them to you know do you outline do you how do you sit down and write a book I feel like if you're going to write a book for the first time, the most important thing is to discover what that means for you. So like the first book that I wrote was very short because 
I'd never finished anything before. And so I thought, okay, I'm much more likely to finish it if I plan for it to be like tiny. So I did. And then my next book I wrote was slightly longer and the next one was slightly longer than that. And the next one was about the same length. And then I wrote a full length book. And I feel like by that point, I knew a lot more about the process that worked for me because I think like different processes work for different people and also different processes work for different stories. But if you really needed a starting point, I'd say for my process, the most important thing is figuring out who my characters are, why they are the way they are and what they really need from the story by the end. Do you find that you have a different process when you're writing a book versus a series? Like if you know that they're gonna be more, do you have to plan that out in your head beforehand? Well, the problem I've had in the past is that I think it's gonna be a standalone and then I'm like, oh, now it's a series and I haven't <laughs> laid the groundwork for myself at all and I don't know where to go from here. So then I have to like reverse engineer it. Um, but I recently started writing a new series. I'm trying to be very mature and write down a little series Bible for myself. You should always have a series Bible if you wanna write a series. Um, I read that on the internet. And <laughs> if it's a standalone, it's just a lot, it's a lot more freeing because you don't have to plan ahead, but it's a bit limited because you don't want to write an amazing character in this standalone who now can't have a story because it's a standalone. Are you allowed to tell us a little bit about the series that you're, you're um, working on right now? And we won't I, be mad if you say no. <laughs> I don't know how much I am allowed to say, but I feel like I'm just going to say that <laughs> it is, it's a romantic comedy series um, and it's a small town series and it's about siblings. Shocker for me. <laughs> um, and the first book is about a reformed con woman who is trying her best and frequently failing. That's amazing. So <laughs> when, when do you think we might be able to see that on our shelves? in like a year okay <laughs> sorry I did not mean it for it to come off like well I approve of that so. <laughs> um and then I, I did have somebody ask uh if if there's just anything about Talia Hibbert that like we should know like if I mean obviously we're all going to be best library friends now like what do we need to know about our new friend Talia Hibbert I'm super boring especially right now, because there's nothing to do to make me less boring. <laughs> um, I don't like phone calls, um, which disappoints my relatives greatly. <laughs> and I really like cookies. That's it. Oh, what do you call them cookies or do you are you doing that for us because we're an American audience or would you call it a biscuit? Oh, no. Here, cookies are a specific type of biscuit. Oh, oh. <laughs> what are they? You know, the ones with like chocolate chips in them, like big, big yep. biscuits with uh, that's cookies. OK. All right. <laughs> wow. Like blown my mind. That's just a chocolate. <laughs> that's a chocolate chip cookie here. All of our cookies are cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any British food that if we what, once the pandemic times are over and we can all go to England, um, not as a all, not as a group. I'm sorry, guys. We can't all go together. Um, but what what do we need to eat when we go to England, or what do English we not food. need to eat? What do we need to avoid? English food is not good. Oh, I know. Fish and chips. Fish and chips is good. They snapped yeah. on fish and chips. Oh, that's about it. I'm sorry. That's about it. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else, only eat tea or only drink tea if somebody bullies you into it. And yeah. Eat some fish and chips. Um. Well, Talia, you have just been an utter delight to talk to. Thank you so much for, for doing this and for um, just giving us an absolutely wonderful Saturday afternoon. Uh, thank you. This is amazing. Thank you for having me. I've had tons of fun. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you everyone for coming.